it's like some kind of a fairy tale, you know, where you, you stumble across some strange thing in the forest and he says, hey, stick this in your mouth. Well, well, what is it? Oh, don't worry about that. Just put it in your mouth. And you put it in your mouth and it starts to burn. And you go, oh my God. And he goes, wait, are you? And are the you guy in the forest, about- the guy in the forest goes, well, that's your fault. Why would you listen to some stupid person in the forest you've never even met before? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to IO Radio with your hosts, Adam and Sal. Hi, everyone. <laughs> One, you like you jumped in really fast the first take, and, and I thought, okay, now we're good, because there's always that pause, so, okay. <laughs> um, today's show is going to be a little bit more of a freeform discussion, and it's about an issue that we've both been talking about and everybody talks about. Uh, and it has to do with uh, talking points and philosophy about some of the things that crypto people harp on as being really important to them. So I'm obviously a moderator of a, a crypto critical subreddit. So I'm out there in the trenches debating with people on a regular basis about what they're talking about and the value of crypto. And we just get bombarded by a number of very, very common arguments, and so much so that we've actually produced a list called the Tired Crypto Talking Point List. So far, there's about 17 or 18 of these recurring talking points that most crypto people use as a reason for why they're into crypto and why crypto is going to be the future. We've already spent a lot of time. There's a, there's a link on our website at ioradio.org where you can see the full list. We're going to go through them one by one and we're going to dissect and unpack them and see what they mean. And we invite you to give us your feedback as well. So today we're going to start with crypto talking point number one, which is it's decentralized. That's like the big thing. Oh yeah. It's decentralized. It's way better. Decentralizing something is supposed to be a really, really important key critical element of Bitcoin and blockchain. And we're going to ask, we're going to dive into this and ask what exactly is decentralization and does it make things better and why? And then we'll compare whether or not the crypto that they are into actually fits those parameters. Sounds good. Let's dive in. Okay, so the first thing I would say is, why is decentralization so important? What is it? What do you think uh, they mean by that, Sal? For me, forget about what crypto people mean. Let's look at decentralization in general. I think really you have to categorize this into two separate properties. Are we talking about functionality? So am I trying to decentralize? So I'm, tr- I'm attempting to eliminate a single point of failure. So that's a, a form of decentralization. If I have a distributed computing system, if I have a cluster right, with a like bunch the of nodes, yeah. Or if you run VMware and you have, you know, a five node cluster, you know, you're decentralizing your, your VM infrastructure, if you will. Mm-hmm. Now, do you mean that, or do you mean decentralization of control where you're worried about the system being controlled by a single entity? or a single special interest or a a single group that has a a certain purpose. And in our democracies, we attempt to decentralize control a little bit, at least in the legislative branch, by electing multiple representatives, right? We don't have one guy that's in charge of passing all the laws. We elect a whole bunch of people and we decentralize the control a little bit. And maybe you can use that a bit as a, a synonym for democratize, if you will. And I think a lot of the time when crypto people are talking about this, what they're actually saying is they're saying, okay, no, this is, um, the the control is decentralized, guys. It's democratized. When in reality, all that's decentralized is the actual underlying functionality, meaning, you know, if you have a failure of a node, the whole system won't go down. And those are two very different things. So I think there's a bait and switch when crypto people are talking about it. So you you think that... um... They're, the main reason why they want something decentralized is so there's no um, dictators, no master control over everything, right? I think that's what they say. Right. I think if you look under the hood and you start investigating these systems, it becomes quite apparent that no, actually, these systems aren't decentralized in any meaningful way when it comes to who and how they're controlled. Right. I mean, 
I would I would ask your typical crypto guy. And by the way, if you're a crypto person listening to this, call us up, contact us. We'll put you on and we'll we'll have a discussion with you. We're open to that. Um, but I would ask him, well, give me an example of something that is centralized that is really bad. And give me an example of something that is decentralized and represents something really good. And I don't, I honestly don't know what they would say. Do you? Well, like a lot of it just. I mean, I know everything well, is in the abstract with these guys, but well, let's got to be, be some specifics. Let, let's be concrete. Um, DNS. DNS is a distributed database. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a certain portion of it, which is, you know, delegated responsibility and it's decentralized. However, this system, this decentralized system does require a certain level of centralization right? in that, you know, uh, there's a standards body that's in charge of it and there are root DNS servers. Right. And so there, there is a bit of uh, centralization. Yeah. So, you know, is there something that's purely decent, like completely decentralized? I'm sure you can find examples. Well, let's look um, at the DNS example you cited, right? For those that don't know, uh, DNS is basically an array of servers that run on the internet that are responsible for knowing what computer you connect to when you type in a host name. So if you put in google.com or ioradio.org, you are querying these domain name servers and there's an array of them. There's top level ones and there's mid level ones. And they are the directory like yellow pages and they tell where things go. Now, obviously this is decentralized so that if one of them goes down, you still are able to visit the websites, right? That's the fault tolerance that decentralizing things provides. But at the same time, if there wasn't a a single authority that said, here is where Google goes, then different systems would say, well, I'm going to point Google to Bob's server and I'm going to point Google to, you know, Sam's server. And there would be, it would be chaos. So ironically, behind every decentralized system that actually does something useful, there is some central authority. The functionality of the system is decentralized, but the control in many cases is centralized. Okay. So you are, you do have this authority and this authority is delegating authority to you know, other groups so that they can control their own domains and the DNS infrastructure underneath their own domain. You know, this assumption that decentralizing something immediately makes it better. I just cannot find a whole lot of examples in the real world to that effect. And this is something that I'll ask the crypto people. Now, what's the motivation for somebody to do good if there is no, you know, oversight? Right. Because they have a profit motive, but we have to make sure that there are some things that are controlled for you need a neutral third party that's governing some of these systems yeah you know, i think it also plays into that libertarian concept of the hand of the market right if you just let everybody do their own thing the market will kind of weed out who the bad guys are but the problem is in the history of civilization that hasn't always worked out that way there's a lot of bad people that that gain more and more power when they're not regulated yeah, I mean, I think when people hear the word free market, what they really think of is a fair market. And when we look at the actual empirical evidence, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that these markets just spontaneously emerge if we remove all regulation. In fact, we see the opposite. We see people who are self-interested exerting power to promote their own you know, wealth right. or power or whatever interest they have. So... I, I don't know. I think we have to acknowledge the fact that if you do want a neutral playing field, you need referees mm-hmm. and you need those referees to not be corrupted. And I, and I think this sort of ties into a really central point about propagandizing crypto, which is they point to real problems where the referees in our society aren't neutral or where they're, 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 you know, they're, they're also, those referees are also playing the game or, you know, after the, the first quarter is done, they're taking off, they're switching the Jersey from the refs and they're putting on a team's Jersey and they're legitimate problems, mm-hmm. but the, the solutions that are proposed under crypto don't solve any of the problems, right? These systems are just, if you look under the hood, they're just as centralized in terms of being controlled by a special interest group. And I don't know if you want to talk about any of these systems in particular, whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin. We can get into that a little bit later once we start unpacking how crypto specifically, whether it is centralized or not. You know, the the situation of of just assuming that because somebody's in control, that's bad. 
you know, they, as you say, they will, they will pull out an example that is more often the exception than the rule. You know, there's plenty of things that we use every day that are managed by central authorities and centralization that work really well. Roads and highways and electricity and the internet service and all of that couldn't run if it was just a complete free market. I mean, the internet itself only exists because of government, the central authority that mandated it. And this is one of the big ironies I find with the the crypto people is they just take the fact, they take the internet for granted, right? Now, those of us that were old enough, we were around before the internet, right? And I was into bulletin board systems and online information services before the internet was around. And back then, there were- It was hard to find stuff. It was hard to find stuff. Well, not only that, but- It was all proprietary. There was uh, dozens of different computer networks. Uh, They were all run by different big companies and they all charged outrageous amounts of money to access. You would pay by the minute to get on CompuServe and it was like 13, 15, $16 an hour. If you were on CompuServe, you couldn't send email to somebody on the source, right? There was no, I think early on, there was no gateways between any of these systems. They were, they were little islands and CompuServe served CompuServe and AOL served AOL and the source served it. And there was the Sierra network and there were all of these little small islands and they all controlled their little walled gardens. It was extremely expensive and you had to be relatively well resourced to even access these things. What made the internet special wasn't that this was the first use of client server computing, that it was commissioned by the government and therefore it was a public resource. It was owned by the public. It wasn't controlled by any single special interest. But But hold on right there. Like, isn't it though, like just to play devil's advocate for a moment here, you know, isn't it really, we owe sort of Tim Berners-Lee a huge debt of gratitude um, in terms of building something that was open and interoperable. And one could argue that's, that's, that is decentralization. It allowed independent parties to participate in this network, but still have some level of interoperability. Well, you need to understand so Isn't the- that an example of decentralization? To some degree, but the internet was created, it was originally um, a project from the Defense Department, and the the objective of it was to create a distributed network. The proper term would be distributed more than decentralized, uh, where all of the nodes that operate the network are physically located in different locations, and it was originally a military project where you would take the control systems, which were all controlled by central authorities, but you would distribute them in different physical locations and link them all together with communications lines. And that way, if any one location went out, it didn't destroy the entire network. So it was just taking the network and physically decentralizing it. And since it was, uh, uh, and you know, it started with most of the universities because they were operating from grant money from the government. So the government tasked these academics to create this network originally for the Department of Defense it was called DARPAnet originally. And that yeah. stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And then the Defense Department had their version, and then the academics had their version. And of course, you create a big network where you've got one university connected to another university connected to another university. You know, these guys are going to start creating some interesting applications to enable cooperation. And so they created all these little systems services that would run on top of the network. One of them was called Usenet, which was like a bulletin board that spanned universities and then entire regions. Of course, email. Yeah. And even DNS, like even DNS, if you look at the old school, like the the original IETF documentation for how these protocols developed, I mean, there were people that were just keeping like massive host files, right? Every server had to had a have, had to have a host file, and you had to update that thing. So, you know, DNS, you you sort of see where these standards come out of. Yeah, I mean, you of, could I mean, not send somebody an email if there wasn't some master directory that said, "Here's where that." Here's where that email box is. And so even from the very beginning, this decentralized network only had functionality because everybody that participated in the network agreed that certain sources of data were going to be the authority. This is going to be authority for domains. This is the authority for the email addresses at this university, et cetera. 
or they're they're basically using a protocol that they all agree to and that protocol has rules and regulations so there's a central authority that's regulating the communication or regulating you know that type of communication whether it's email or dns so ultimately this decentralization of these systems depends on some kind of central authority even if that's a neutral uh, protocol that's you know designed by engineers yeah and of course behind every bit of code is a, a one or more people that are the architects of that code and I, while everybody likes to say that uh, open source is kind of a community driven project it's almost never that it's actually usually just one or two main uh maintainers and a uh, and allowing the public to take a look at the code and offer suggestions. But the people that have commit access are usually the gatekeepers. And that's true today, even as it pertains to crypto. And we can talk about that later. But the idea is that the, the internet wouldn't even exist, which is the main platform that all of this stuff runs on. It would not exist if it weren't for central authorities cre uh, subsidizing the creation of the internet and then allowing it to be used publicly by anybody that wanted to. And that is what made it work. It, was, it wasn't just a combination that it was, because micro, if Microsoft, you know, you saw, we saw what happened when Microsoft tried to create a browser and foist it on everybody else. Everybody's like, yeah, this just works with your shit and not Apple's shit. And Apple tried to do stuff like that, you know, and everybody wants to try to create something and they fight with each other. But at the end of the day, it's their property and all the other competing companies are kind of, apprehensive about embracing somebody else's standards but if the government creates it and the government says hey no company owns this that's what really helped it, the internet take off we are in agreement yeah so the one of the big ironies is that the the greatest example of something that's a decentralized success the internet is not actually decentralized and would never exist if it won for centralized control and even today while the operation of most of the internet backbone is now in the hands of private corporations and stuff that all operates with the approval and permission from the government. All of the airwaves are policed by the government. So it's not completely like a free for all you can't create your own high power antenna and just start broadcasting on whatever frequency you want. The government meters and moderates who can do what, and that's to keep that network from just turning into chaos. Same thing well, with like, uh, cable and fiber and wired connections, right? You can't just run a wire across town, you know? Yeah. Well, like at the end of the day, centralization just is a lot more efficient. It allows a mm -hmm. lot more utility to be created. Centralization of functionality, or at least some having some components of centralization in your, in your functionality. So digital platforms are a great example of that, where you can make really great products and you can have these fantastic user experiences and when you look at the equivalent federated system it just can't iterate as quickly you know i think a lot because my background is in messaging and in telecom i think a lot about the xmpp standard right an amazing standard great standard super potentially interoperable except that it never took hold because you know people wanted to update it they wanted to build new features but these people didn't want to update and so you couldn't talk to them and it never really took hold and instead you had people like WhatsApp, um, you know, and these other messaging companies come in and they were able to make, you know, massive networks that offer a tremendous amount of utility. But the issue with these digital platforms is that not only are they centralized in terms of functionality, but they're centralized in terms of the control. There's no democratic control. So the interests of users and regular citizens aren't represented. And I think that's sort of maybe a good model to look at in the future. If you want to build something that's the opposite of crypto, you know, you, you shouldn't be afraid of centralized functionality. The question really is, how is that system then controlled? Who right. controls it? Who's paying them? What are their interests? What are their motivations? What are the mechanisms we have to make sure they represent all the stakeholder interests? Those are the important questions. But this like veneer of decentralization makes it, you know, better. It, you can dismiss that right away. There's no evidence that this stuff is really fundamentally decentralized in terms of who controls it. Right. And we could probably cite numerous examples where if you decentralize something, it would probably just make it worse. Like, for example, Wikipedia. Right. Wikipedia is a uh, decentralized encyclopedia. Yeah. 
Um, but what really makes it so useful is the fact that there is a central entity, the foundation, and there is a hierarchy of editors that follow very specific rules. And I guess technically it may be possible that you could automate some of that. But at the end of the day, there still has to be people that have a, a particular kind of set of rules, you know, that they're going to follow to keep the thing in order. If it was just allowed anybody to update any article, it would just turn into just a bunch of garbage. Well, hold on. anybody can update any article. Right, but it'll get reverted so, back if it's if it's Right, because you have the letters. So I, I think it's fair to say that Wikipedia is valuable because it's centralized, because it produces enormous network effects because it's not just you, you don't just have a community of like five editors you're drawing in all of the editors from around the world that want to contribute to this type of project so you have a tremendous amount of utility that gets produced and that becomes enormously valuable for everyone and so to, to be able to have those network effects to have those big networks there's a lot of value there's a lot of utility that gets produced Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important that that is centralized. The question, though, of course, is how are these things governed? How are they controlled? Well, let's go over some of the rebuttals that I have here on my page. Um, so first, just because you decentralize something doesn't mean it's better. And this is especially true in the case of crypto. The case for decentralized crypto is based on a phony notion that central authorities can't do anything right which flies in the face of thousands of things that you use each and every day that, quote, inept central government does for you. Do you like electricity, internet, owning your own home and car, roads and highways? Thank the government. And second, decentralizing things, especially in the context of crypto, simply creates additional problems. And we've been talking about this. In, a, in the decentralized world of crypto, code is law, which means there's nobody actually held accountable for things going wrong. And when they do, you're screwed. This comes to something that we haven't really talked about yet, which is in the real world, everybody prefers to deal with entities they know and trust. They don't want trustless transactions. It sounds like a cool buzzword, but most people want reliable authorities who are held accountable for things. Would you rather eat at a restaurant that's been regularly inspected by the health department or some back alley vendor selling meat from the trunk of his car? You know, like it or not, most of us each and every day will almost always pick doing business with somebody who is known and accountable versus some random anonymous transaction. So when well, you think like, about it, you know, what, that's what crypto is. It's just an unaccountable, random thing. Well, I just want to interject here because a lot of this comes down to really basic economic fundamental things. So what we're talking about is the division of labor. You know, do you want to have to be a health inspector every time you go to eat at a restaurant? Mm -hmm. You're going to spend so much time doing that. Like, will you have time to do your actual job? No, it makes sense to hire people to make sure they're not bribed, that they're, you know, paid decently and they go around and they're in charge of regulating restaurants and making sure that they're not doing things that are going to make people sick. And right. that's important. And that makes it more efficient for everyone because I don't have to be a health inspector. I don't have to be an expert on, I don't know, gas line installation or, you know, safe electrical. So when I go to, you know, buy a, a house, I'm going to hire someone to inspect that home for me so that they can tell me if things are done properly. I'm not going to have to do that for myself. That's, that's crazy. You're never going to be able to do that in a modern society. We need to divide labor. Right. We need to have people who specialize. Yeah, this just plays into that other crypto related crypto talking point, which is be your own bank. And not everybody has the time or the capability to be their own bank or to audit the code that they're using to manage their crypto wallet or whatever. And you can't just say, oh, it's open source. So you could look at the code if you want. Well, I don't know how to read that code. Well, somebody, you just kind yeah. of believe that somebody out there has read the code and if there was something bad in it, they would let us all know. Which, yeah, just learn solidity. Just learn <laughs> solidity and write your own smart contracts. But it's just like, um, who, you know, crypto is supposed to be trustless, but it sure sounds like you're having to trust somebody. In this case, instead of somebody who's accountable and central and you know who they are, 
you're trusting yeah. some random person. Hopefully they've looked at the source code and said something. You just assume they have. I think that's yeah, a pretty foolish assumption. And hopefully there isn't a cartel of other people who also can potentially make money and they may also be lying to you. And so let's see, number four is you, you still aren't avoiding middlemen, authorities, or third parties using crypto. In fact, quite the opposite. You need third parties to convert crypto into fiat or vice versa. You depend upon third parties who write and audit all the code you use to process the transactions. You depend upon third parties to operate the network. You depend upon middlemen to provide all the utilities and infrastructure upon which crypto depends. So this idea that everything is decentralized and you don't need any middlemen is another kind of fallacy that people say. And they just say, oh, well, that's not the middlemen I'm talking about. I'm talking about banks. Again, you know, are there problems with the financial industry? Yes. You know, is the current regime of how banking is conducted in North America perfect? No. Right. But does, does crypto solve those problems? No. In fact, it looks like all of the problems that exist in banking in terms of capture by special interests and exploitation, extraction, all of these things are actually worse in crypto. And that's exactly what we would expect to find if fundamentally the control of the of these systems was just as centralized, except there was no transparency. There were no mechanisms to make sure people were held accountable. We'd expect to see that there was more crime, more exploitation. And guess what? That's exactly what we see when we look mm -hmm. at all these crypto systems. So surprise, surprise. Yeah, it kind of defies logic when you, you, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are like, the system is messed up. Whoever's running it right now is not doing a good job. So, hey, let's give this 12-year-old access to nuclear weapons and see what he can do. I mean, it just seems like these people are grasping at some very bizarre straws. Uh, you know, hey, let's let, let's let this crypto thing, this goofy system that was designed 15 years ago that hasn't proven it is good at anything. Let's let's try that instead. Yeah. So, you know, inst instead of being an adult and analyzing the institution that you're criticizing and thinking about ways in which the governance of these institutions can be improved or actually having ideas about how to make this stuff better to make it work for people regular people, you're going to give all the control and all the power to who exactly? To a bunch of unaccountable, unknown, anonymous people that you just think have your best interests at heart? Okay, that seems a little naive to me. Yeah, I mean, when you decentralize something, when you leave out the central authority, then you have no accountability. And that also means that uh, there's not really an easy way to fix things when things go wrong. There's Because there's nobody that you can run to and say, hey, Something yeah. bad happened. Crypto people just go, oh, well, you, don't, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah, ir yeah, irreversibility isn't a good property to have for a payment system or for a banking system or for like any system when yeah. you think about it. Because ultimately mistakes get made. We're all human. So I'll, I ask crypto people, you know, give me an example of something that's really decentralized that works. And I mean, what, what could they say? BitTorrent? Okay, maybe, but BitTorrent really is useless without a central directory, without some on, kind of site that can show you where the other torrents are, you still can't, then the peer-to-peer -peer stuff is not useful. Also, we can get into what percentage of traffic for torrents are used for legitimate purposes versus illegitimate purposes, but that's a separate discussion. Uh, number five, if you look at any crypto project, you will ultimately find it's not actually decentralized at all. At the beginning and end of every blockchain is a small group of people who wield disproportionate power and influence and have the ability to restrict who can do what on the system. And it's pretty interesting because just today there was a news story about how Tether, the stablecoin issuer, has frozen, I think, $225 million worth of stablecoin tokens that are that's claiming are linked to human trafficking. So this is a, a staple of the crypto industry where, uh, you know, these stable coins are supposed to be proxies for money. And yet, you know, Tether is deciding, guess what? You're not getting your money. But yeah, but even like, you know, even more fundamental to that is how do we know that Tether didn't freeze those stable coins 
to appease certain authorities and just create an extra 225 million or they had another because they could just create this, yeah we don't know there's no accountability random. and and they gave them they gave those tethers to the same money launderers because they probably don't want it like just speaking as a hypothetical if i'm running a criminal conspiracy and my partners are money launderers and drug dealers and people who kill people and traffic people and um you know have no qualms about taking human life i'm probably not going to freeze 225 million dollars of their assets i'm probably just going to make it look like i did and yeah we then, don't really know it's yeah, so it's interesting there's, there's no way there's no way to know because this stuff is totally centralized even more than our democratic systems well crypto people will say tether is tether tether is not bitcoin bitcoin is different nobody can you know there's no not redeeming bitcoin one bitcoin is worth one bitcoin but obviously in order to use it you still have to convert it so you run into all these roadblocks that are controlled and uh, influenced by central entities so again no matter how decentralized you are you can't avoid it again the crypto people will go oh eventually we'll just be dealing in bitcoin natively which yeah I don't hold yeah, your but, breath but, on that. But, but hold on, like even if we take that at face value and we say, okay, like like it goes deeper than just the banking, you know, that the fiat on and off ramps are centralized. I mean, that's not really saying. Bitcoin itself is centralized in terms of who controls it. Right. It's it's a cartel. There are the people that work on the software, which are extremely few, by the way, and they're all funded by companies who want to make money off of Bitcoin. Then you have the exchanges. And then you have people like Tether and they form a cartel and all of their interests are aligned. It's all centralized. There's no other, I, I don't understand yeah. why crypto is magic because there's no other place in the world where we have this viewpoint. We don't go to McDonald's and say, oh yeah, McDonald's is decentralized because it's separate franchises. And you know, look at the employees. The employees are all separate people. It's decentralized. McDonald's is decentralized. No. Nobody says that. I think, well, I think all... crypto people would say it's not decentralized. <laughs> well, but, but like that's the argument that they're making because it's not decentralized because all of those people that are working there, all of the owners, all have a single unified interest and that's making as much money as possible. What if, so, what if McDonald's corporate was replaced by an AI bot writ by, yes. designed by Sam Altman and it just had specific code and everybody could see the code and then they just declare code is law, it's decentralized, and if it does anything evil, well, you know, you didn't have to use eat at McDonald's. Well, like, sign me up for the mint. I'm in on that, 100%. You know, give me the crypto coin. I see a point in decentralizing, right? You decentralize to em eliminate single points of failure. That that's fair, right? You de you deset or I would call that whatever word you want to use, mm -hmm. whatever word you want to use, whatever whatever synonym or you know adjective you want to use. Go ahead, and then you also want to decentralize in terms of how things are controlled. You want to make sure that there is some accountability that all stakeholders in a system are represented. That's also a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I see a point in decentralization, yeah. but I do agree that this word has been sort of co opted and now is used to pull the wool over people's eyes to, to run a bait and switch. And so I think your, your sort of your initial reaction, I think is quite justified. Okay, so let's play part of this, uh, this clip. And if you wanna stop it anywhere, just say, hey, stop and- Blockchain, blockchain is, decentralized is decentralized and not, not under, under anybody's, anybody's control. control. Is blockchain really decentralized? How decentralized is Bitcoin really? I view Bitcoin as money without masters. Decentralization is key to keeping that money without masters. Decentralization is, is a technical mechanism to achieve some properties that are key to Bitcoin. Namely By the way, that's, that that's Adam Back Permissionless, right bearer, unseizable. That's Satoshi. <laughs> and uh, survivable, <laughs> so that it's very hard to shut the network down. In earlier segments, we discussed the pros and cons between centralized and decentralized systems. It's arguable whether decentralizing something is even a good thing, but beyond that, let's examine whether or not blockchain is, in any meaningful way, actually decentralized. In order to talk specifics and cite evidence, we may single out specific cryptos like BTC and ETH, but the same can typically be said for most cryptocurrencies and various other crypto projects. If code is law, then whoever writes the code is the ruler. 
Blockchain is basically a database, which is created and operated by a specific block of computer code. Computer code is a set of instructions or rules that tells the entire system how to behave. This code is basically the law of blockchain. So, whoever writes the code is the de facto lawgiver. Blockchain code is typically thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lines of instruction, and not easy to read and understand except by those who are programming experts. Crypto proponents argue that the value of blockchain is that, quote, nobody owns the network, and, quote, nobody unilaterally controls the network. That's their idea of things being decentralized, as opposed to governments and other special interests that can impose their will on everybody else. That's the bad thing blockchain supposedly protects us from. That's my, my fun snarky thing there with the emperor. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's important also to call out that like if we look at actually how the protocol is designed, I mean, never mind even about the, the you know, the, and I think you'll go into the developers and who controls it and right. who runs it. But even beyond that, the way the protocol is designed, it distributes 50% of all the resources to, you know, in the first four years. Right. And it's estimated that about half of the Bitcoin may be controlled by as few as 80 people. So whose system does this serve? Why is it designed this way? And, and when you start asking those questions, you start, you know, coming up with some interesting answers. You know, Bitcoin doesn't look like it was ever designed to be a useful form of electronic cash, which right. is what it says it's supposed to be. It, however, it looks like it was designed to create network effects, to get people to adopt it, to, to try to get as many people to start using it as possible. And that 50% distribution, that halving schedule was part of that. So we see it's centrally controlled in yet another way in terms of the ownership of this quote unquote asset, the speculative digital token. Yeah, you know, I never really thought about the unfairness of the halvening, you know, in that, in that, you know, first you get this number of Bitcoins and then every four years that number cuts in half. I mean, that's a dramatic drop, you know, it, after a certain number of years, the amount of return is so infinitesimal that it's like, <laughs> is it even worth it? You know, and, yeah. and I understand that they expect this to be a deflationary token, so it should increase in value. But if it doubles in value every four years, that's kind of a bit extreme, I think. Well, it's it just goes to show this is not a de this is not democratic in any way. Mm -hmm. It's not decentralized in any way. In fact, it's extremely centralized. The distribution of the tokens is centralized right. in just a few people. That's so another what thing. What are we pretending? Yeah, uh, why are we playing this game? In another section of the documentary, I talk about how mining works, right? And the way this works is you have all these computers that are controlling, trying to guess the right hash to get the block reward. So you have all these mining consortiums, these p groups of people that are trying to guess the code. Whoever guesses the code gets the block reward. It's a winner-take-all situation. So that is absolutely not decentralized. That is very, very centralized. Imagine you had a contest and you told everybody to show up, right? Hold, and hold and you're on. only giving an award yeah. to one person, but everybody has to do a whole bunch of work, the same amount of work. Yeah. And one, but one of those people is not going to get get the reward. How long would it take before all of those people form just one group and split it amongst themselves? Yes, you know? that's a that's a good point. So that point absolutely is is correct. It that shows gets that centralization. Correct. Yes, absolutely. So it te it te tre this the way the system is designed tends towards centralization. There, like there is an argument though that because that process is fair, because anyone could have guessed it, um, that it's technically decentralized. But you're correct. Once you start going down the road, once you fall this to its logical conclusion, you realize that the system is not set up to be decentralized. Well, it would be fair if everybody only got like say one roll of the dice right if every single player got one roll then whoever wins yeah. that would be fair but it's that, not that, that way in crypto in crypto it's true. whoever has the most money the, the biggest mining rig the most mining rigs they get more and more dice rolls so it 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 totally favors the rich and the powerful, the people that have more resources. So it's not in any way decentralized and it's also not in any way democratized. It's, yes. it's totally a plutocracy. Um, all right, let's continue. But in reality, are people in the crypto space really protected from private special interests exerting control over the network? Let's take a closer look. 
While the Bitcoin code is open source and public, what goes in that code is under the control of specific private interests. As of this writing, there are only a handful of people who have access to the source code and the ability to commit code changes. Those with access to the source are associated with for-profit corporations like Chaincode Labs, OKCoin, BitMEX, and Blockstream. There's also an association called MIT's Digital Currency Initiative. The MIT Association lends an air of legitimacy to the guardians of the source, until further investigation reveals that it is funded by Chaincode, BitMEX, Jack Dorsey, and Europe's largest digital asset management company. So this is an interesting screen, and this is a good example of some of the stuff that I have in the documentary, that it, if you don't stop it, you don't realize how much data there is here. This is a list of the Bitcoin grants right here, and you can find this page on the internet. And it shows who's giving money to the people that are in charge of Bitcoin. And you can see it's specific private entities that have an interest in manipulating and controlling the development team. The better question, though, is... How do we know that that development team isn't getting money in a hundred different ways? Also, we don't. We have no. We have no way. We have no way of knowing that. Whereas, if this was a system that was developed centrally, that had particular governing authority, like governing mechanisms, you could potentially, you know, expose that. You could have an an agency that would be in charge of making sure these people weren't bribed. That's not the case here. Yeah, there's no bill of rights for crypto people. There's no constitution. The closest you have is the code, and nobody really knows the code. They don't know what it can and cannot do. They just have a vague idea. Yeah. Company, coin shares, among others. It would be foolish to not assume the interests of these for-profit companies have an influence over this, quote, association, and are focused more on increasing the value of their stake and less about the technological efficiency in insulating the world from centralization which might explain why BTC is one of the least technologically capable versions of crypto, despite being the highest valued. So while on the outside it looks like there's some kind of decentralized association controlling the laws that run blockchain, in reality, it's a small cartel of private corporations. Also, many people think just because a project is open source, that means it's run by the community. This is false. Most open source projects have a master maintainer who has totalitarian control over the project. They are not obligated whatsoever to answer to any community, and most of the developers have other business interests they serve. In fact, many open source projects are only open source because they use code that requires any derivative work to also be open source. There is absolutely no guarantee an open source project has any oversight nor is there any guarantee that the code is the result of community involvement. This is an interesting point that I, that I want to bring up, is that um, Bitcoin is released under this MIT license, which is not, not the most liberal software license. The MIT license also allows people to take the code and use it for proprietary um, closed source purposes. Which you'd think if this thing is really supposed to be a gift to the public, it should be released under a little bit more of a liberal licensing term. I won't get into that. This is an area of interest of mine, but I won't get into the, the ins and outs of open source licensing. Um, but you know what I mean? If you're going to create something and it's a gift to the community, it's supposed to be a fully community communal project. Well, but hold on. But it's permitting, it's, it's permitting, that's actually a more permissive license in a way, right? Because they're explicitly permitting commercial use and proprietary use. But whether or not that adheres to, you know, like Richard Stallman's version of what free software should be you know, okay, that's a different discussion. So I don't know. I, I, I'd have to look at this a bit more closely. I don't know. I'm not sure what I think about that. I mean, I see both sides of it, but if you're going to create a system that's going to be using their code and you can make it proprietary and not have to uh, let people know what, what you're doing with it, that for a system like this, I think that's a red flag. There's other scenarios where maybe you want to create something and allow other people to make private stuff with it. Yeah. With other blockchains like Ethereum, there's an even thinner veneer of decentralization. Ethereum has its de facto king, the original programmer Vitalik Buterin. Skip over this embarrassing part where he. 
<laughs> it's, it is it is hard to watch, but I don't mind. Okay, I'll do right. it. The community's Pied Piper. I almost feel like this might have been a low revered. blow. <laughs> It's 2.0, yo. It's 2.0, yo. It's 2.0, yo. It's 2.0, yo. We'll go off the cathedral. We must coordinate. But we ain't no cathedral. No one's I like how all the women are off to one side <laughs> so they can make a hasty exit, you know? <laughs> Man. Nate, every team and every project we could get far. Subvergic biologic, we work like a bazaar. Yeah. <laughs> He's created a nonprofit organization called the Ethereum Foundation. You know, you know which what? Sounds I, cons- I, 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 I'm going to give him props for that. He got on stage and he did a little nerd rap. Good for him. It might be Good in service him. of an, it might be in service of investment fraud. It might be exploitative and he's fucking over a lot of people. But at, you know, at least he has the the courage to get up on stage and do that. Hey, hey, uh, you know, I can't I, I don't know if I was in his situation how much different I would necessarily behave because it he, you know, he was just a gamer that kind of discovered created something that just exploded and you know it's it's his whole life now he's made so much money through it i mean it's hard to you know it's i think he's probably a relatively decent guy i don't think he's like one of the the major grifters you know but they do get caught up in this i mean this is like upton sinclair right it's hard to get a person to understand something when their salary depends on their not understanding it so Mm -hmm. You know, Vitalik's probably a true believer. It's not, it's easy to be a true believer if you're making a bunch of money off of your religion. I will say, I'll tell you this. He's a moderator for the Ethereum subreddit. And I am notorious. It's one of the few pro crypto subreddits that I'm allowed to go in there and just engage with people. And the mods, I'm sure every time I post, people report me because, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and the mainstream ones, they, they, they don't, they call us trolls if we point out rational arguments that don't support their stuff, but Ethereum, they don't, you know? So I have a tremendous amount of respect for some of the people, a lot of the people in the Ethereum community, because I do think they are at least a little bit more open to criticism. And I think they're a little bit more tech oriented. Than the Bitcoin well, did, people, yeah. Well, they did move to proof of st- uh, proof of stake, uh-huh. so they were willing to compromise on some of their foundations. Yeah, and corporate. I did this documentary before they moved to it, and it was one of those things that was coming soon, so I couldn't really yeah. count on it happening. But I do talk about proof of stake. There's nothing here that is necessarily invalid about my description of Ethereum and how it works, except that they have now moved to proof of stake, so they're not wasting as much electricity. But they still have the same network congestion D problems. It may not be as bad now because of the how they've removed some of the profit motives, you know, with the mining. It's, it's, it's they're staking instead of um, you know, just using hash power. Yeah, but, I mean Ethereum is just like a more complicated way to run an investment fraud. Ultimately, it's the same thing. It's an investment of money up front. You hope to be able to sell it to claim returns from funds contributed by new investors. That's what it fundamentally is. And there's like this extra little bit, which is, okay, well, you can do some stuff with it. So potentially, you know, there's some kind of connection to real world usefulness. But when you look at what it's actually good for, it's just good for running scams. Did you see my tweet uh, this week uh, about Ethereum? I didn't. What do you say? Sometimes I'm debating with people and I'll come up with something I think is kind of funny and I'll, I'll tweet it. It was um, Ethereum's smart contracts make a WordPress site look like advanced alien technology. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're if then statements integrated into the blockchain are still just decades behind modern database technologies capabilities and they still think they're they're onto something smart like they're kind of well it's like an interesting technical challenge like it's okay okay if we if we totally hamstring ourselves how can we make this stuff that's been working for 40 years work so to a computer science nerd that might be really interesting it's just not practically useful in the real world i was just going to say i had a twitter conversation recently uh, arguing with someone about bitcoin and the fact that the CFTC called it a commodity. And when I was like pressing them, one of the things they told me was that Bitcoin is sometimes, it's a commodity and sometimes it's not a commodity. 
And I was like, what the fuck? Is this like Schrodinger's commodity? Like, what, what do you mean? It doesn't matter what argument I have. You just changed it so that, okay, well, it's no, it's not a commodity here. Okay, it is a commodity there. So That's sometimes- That's the beauty of when, decentralization. You can say, oh, yeah. over here, it's this. Over there, it's that. Yeah, so like a lot of these crypto, crypto talking points are the same. It's just, you can't get them to, they, they constantly shift the goalposts. So we'll talk about what's coming up right now is how decentralized Ethereum is. And in fact, if you argue with Ethereum people, most of them won't even argue with you that it's not, you know, that it's decentralized. They all pretty much know it is not really decentralized, but it's not fundamentally any different than uh, Bitcoin, as you'll see here. Sensual in theory, but is little more than a marketing company stacked with board members whose main skills seem to be loyalty and willingness to promote Ethereum rather than technology and finance. The real decisions regarding the future of blockchain rest with the development team, which are not in place via any reliable consensus mechanism. Like some other crypto projects, Ethereum has a published process whereby the community can petition to help direct the future of the technology. It's basically an appeal that someone can make, but ultimately it's up to the centralized, very small development team to decide what goes in code and in policy. So while there's a mechanism for, quote, consensus to apply to blockchain development, at the end of that hallway is always a small group of overseers who have the final say, and presumably nothing happens without King Vitalik's approval. Now, this is really a, a key thing, right? They always talk about how, you know, anybody in the community can make a presentation to try to improve yeah. or change the code, but they never talk about how that, co how that decision gets made. It's not like there's a democratic vote. There's no constitution which says, here's who has which rights. It's still a small group of people. Yeah, and the, it's similar to the Bitcoin improvement process, which right. has the same issues. And it's interesting because people are, are saying that, well, we've developed these DAOs and this is more democratic, but when you look at it, it's really just who has the most tokens or right. who has the most money gets to govern it. So in most of these projects, we now know the code, the law is centralized. What about other aspects of the operation? So maybe there's only really space for oh, like I remember. 10 or 20. So you know how Nick Weaver has his iron law blockchain? Oh, which is that for the people you know you know so when people when someone says that you know blockchain is good or blockchain is good for x they don't actually understand x and it's sort of this this truism but there's another truism for these systems in terms of how they're governed and how decisions get get made these systems are claiming to be something right they're claiming to be an electronic system of an electronic a system of electronic cash for bitcoin or with ethereum they want to be you know whatever they say, what is their marketing, you know, a world computer. Um, but effectively, they're proposing that they do something. So I have a proposal. Has there ever been a decision that has been made or adopted that has that would have potentially affected the value of Bitcoin and Ethereum, but made it better for its proposed use? So ha has anything ever been adopted like that? I don't think that it has. And I don't think that it ever can be because the people who are actually in charge of making these decisions want to pump that token price up as high as it possibly will go. So they literally cannot adopt a decision. They cannot choose to make something to, to make a, they can't make a choice that would make these systems better for actually doing something in the real world. Yeah. I think you've said this in other episodes too. Um, yeah, you feel you like can decide to, you can cut it if you want. Adam. You feel you feel like like uh, there's a and I agree with you. There's a conflict of interest between what's what's in the interest of the technology and the community and what's in the interest of making the tokens valuable. And I point this out in my documentary when I say um, Bitcoin is not the most technologically advanced version of Bitcoin, BTC, B, you know, BCH, Bitcoin Cash has a larger block size and can handle more transactions and is less congested. But that's not the dominant one. So what's in the best interest of the community versus where the money goes are two different things. Yeah, it's impossible. Maybe the law is that it's impossible for these people to adopt a proposal that would affect negatively affect the. Well, the they're in it for the money. The Everybody in this yeah. industry, this this idea that they want to help mankind and help people be their own banks and bank the unbanked. 
that's not backed up by any actual evidence. What the real evidence points to is they're just doing whatever they can to make money. And, and it's important to point that out because like the definition of corruption is when the stated goals of a system are like opposite to its actual goals. These people say that these systems are for a certain purpose and it's not. These systems are to enrich them. That's why they're there. Well, so I think systems, it's obvious, but, but these but people just have to call it out. Well, they keep this saying stuff, over and over. It's not, it's, you know, that's that new mantra. If you say something enough, it'll just be true. Oh, well, we, we have to call this out. These people are corrupt. These systems are fundamentally corrupt. Well, here, wait, hold up, hold up, hold up. That's where decentralization comes into play. <laughs> because, oh, shit. because. I didn't think about decentralization. That system might be corrupt, but that's dec That's over there. This system is over here and it has not been investigated by the SEC yet. So it's perfectly okay. Yeah. That's the value of decentralization. It's called yes, plausible exactly. deniability. Yeah. This is another section where we talk about the infrastructure of the internet. And we talk about how everything that uh, crypto depends upon wouldn't exist without centralized authorities. Uh, the you know, the yeah. internet company that manages the things, the United Nations, which organizes things, and the, the Federal Communications Commission, which regulates stuff. There's all kinds of entities that create the infrastructure that crypto depends on. And any of these entities could at any time say, hey, no more Bitcoin. And if, and there's nothing that, you know, you could do about it. And a lot of crypto people talk about how, oh, Canadian truckers, Canadian truckers, See, if Canadian truckers, if they weren't using regular bank accounts, nobody would be able to seize their stuff. And that's not true. If, uh, you know, as of today, you see that uh, Tether has seized crypto, these authorities, they can control the on and the off ramps. So unless you just want to look at your tokens in, on your computer screen, that's about as much freedom as you really have. Yeah, because you still have to convert it to fiat. So there you go. All right. Well, I think we've uh, it's been almost an hour. Have we? How is this horse dead yet? I I would say that crypto gives us some clues as to what we should build in the future for our own digital platforms. Crypto fundamentally is, uh, or is a collection of systems that are decentralized in terms of how they operate, but centralized in terms of how they're controlled. What we need to do, if we want to build a better Reddit or a better Twitter or a better Facebook, you have to build these systems so that they are centralized in terms of their functionality, which is more efficient. You get better network effects, but they need to be decentralized or democratized in terms of how they're controlled and how they're governed. And that's something that hasn't been built as far as I can tell in, the, in history. And so I think that by looking at decentralization inside of crypto, how it's actually, how it actually manifests itself versus how it's presented, it gives us some interesting clues because we can see the mistakes that these systems have made or the deception, what they're trying to do. And we can actually go and build the opposite thing. So actually, I think they are instructive, even if they're not useful in the real world. I think in terms of... Uh crypto's experiment, right? I don't know if it's instructive is more except as a cautionary tale that we that that some people just don't pay attention to history because it seems like crypto is not doing anything new. It's actually just reliving some old processes that we should have already progressed past, you know, the wildcat banking era, the dangers of what happens when you're dabbling in unregulated markets with no transparency? What happens when you're part of a system where there's no accountability? You know, we've, we, there's oodles of historical examples of, of what happens. It's, it's, it's like some kind of a fairy tale, you know, where you, you stumble across some strange thing in the forest and he says, hey, stick this in your mouth. Well, well what is it? Um, oh, don't worry about that. Just put it in your mouth. And you put it in your mouth and it starts to burn and you go, Oh my God. And he goes, Wait, are you, and are the guy in the forest, about... the guy in the forest goes, well, that's your fault. Why would you listen to some stupid person in the forest? You've never even met before. You know? I think no, but I think a cautionary tales are useful and, you know, seeing what's been built and what 
has been designed and how it's failed can tell you, oh, or it can at least maybe give you some clues as to what should be built. Right. But who's, who, what, who's, who's just, learning just something like, from this? What has I anybody am, learned? I've, I've learned, I've learned anything. I've new? Le- I've, no, well, I've learned because, because I started looking at this because I initially I was quite positive about crypto and blockchain and even Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. This is a, a way to, to manage things. This is a way to have a neutral third party manage a system so you can prevent self-interest from taking hold. So basically and you I, bought into the propaganda yeah. and yeah. then you, but did, but did, did you need all of this stuff to run this extreme course in order for you to realize, hey, this doesn't really live up to its claims? <laughs> well, I... Do we need like, I, like 87 million billion of tether to be printed before people can realize? I don't know, no, but I'm just, I'm just talking about my own personal experience, which is for me, it was useful because I had to deconstruct it. I had to see, well, why are people saying they say they make all these claims and I started looking at it and the more I looked and the, and the more I dug, the more I found it was all complete bullshit. And so that's useful for me. Cause I think that gives me a, a deeper understanding mm-hmm. now. I've learned some things along the way because of that, the, you know, is it useful? Should, would it have been better to not have had any of this? Absolutely. It doesn't mean it's not instructive in terms of showing us what to avoid in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think, um, we had a conversation that may never have found its way into an episode where we talked about, um, ideas about how we could improve things that are wrong with society and technology. Did I ever, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. people, people, people are, uh, proposing crypto because there's a lot of systems that they think are broken. Right. And my argument would be, all right, let's talk about, give me an example of a system that is broken and let's talk about how we could make it better. And if you want to integrate crypto into that and explain to me how crypto would make it better or how decentralizing it would make it better, that's fine. But let's talk about something very, very specific that is not working the right way. And what I found, if you talk to some people about that, oftentimes these things that are broken, they claim are broken, are not really broken. They're just not benefiting them to the degree they think they should. Mm. And usually that's, that's a reasonable assumption because they're not doing a whole lot. Yeah. Or they're selfish people. This issue of like, how do we build a better Reddit? How do we build a better Twitter? We have to rethink and reimagine how we govern people ultimately. Right. But it all comes back to the thing is, is decentralizing it a reasonable approach to solving those problems. And I would say you could have the exact same problems in a decentralized system that you can in a centralized system. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know where decentralizing something um, actually is a guaranteed step in the right direction. Like you could take up a, a social media platform and put nobody in control of it. But that also means that there's nobody there to stop the toxic content and the exploitation. And so yeah. how can, uh, and so, you know, crypto's solution to that is to monetize the whole thing and make it so that people, the, the more, the more you want to be able to do stuff, the more money it requires. And there, and supposedly people with more money are going to behave better. You know, well, that this doesn't is, this sound is, good. Yeah. Either. I mean, this is the fundamental thing. And like you said, a decentralized system can be corrupted just the same. And it has to do with, right. It has to do with money. So if you have a set of founding principles, like if you have a constitution for Twitter, uh-huh. let's say, yeah, how do you make it so that the board, the people who are in charge are going to adhere to that constitution? It's the same problem we have in our democracies. AI have, robots. That's what it is. Well, AI robots. Well, it's, but it's the same problem we have in our democracy with, you know, a revolving door between the civil service and private power and, you know, legalized forms of bribery, which we call lobbying. You know, these are the same issues. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're not easy problems to solve and they're not problems you solve with technology. They're problems you solve with governance. That's what we actually need. We need good quality governance and decentralization is just no governance, you know, I mean, or shadow governance. It's whoever writes the code is the the person behind the scenes in the shadows. It's unaccountable. That is, has some power that doesn't seem to me to be an improvement. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, I have a lot of ideas about how to do this. It's something I've been working on for the last three years, um, but it's it's a hard problem. Yeah, and we could talk about it more, but we probably want to yeah. save that for. We'll wrap episode. that up.
but suffice yeah. to say, this is a, you know, if somebody says decentralizing something is better, ask them to be very, very specific. Give me a very specific example of something that's messed up and how you would decentralize it and explain to me clearly how it makes things better. And if you do that, you'll find that they can't really give you a good response to that. They'll just yeah, say it's the, decentralized. Or the response is like, oh, it improves fault tolerance. Like, okay, yeah, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how do you, when you decentralize control, what happens? When, right. you, when, you, when you decentralize functionality, okay, what happens? When you centralize these things, what happens? That's what we have to investigate. It's not just as simple as, as using a, a word, an adjective. We have to investigate these things and what they actually mean, what they're actually doing. Agreed. Well, there you have it. Is decentralization a good thing? You can make up your own mind and let us know in the comments and all of that. And be sure to visit ioradio.org and catch us on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle, Sal? Sal underscore Bayot. I'm also on Mastodon. Add me on Mastodon. I far prefer to push people there. Yeah, yeah, me Twitter. too. I'm at, I think I'm at um, AM Scream at Mastodon.social. And until next time, we want to thank everybody for tuning in.